My, my screen share is working okay? Yes, it's working perfectly okay. all right. Everything perfect, perfect. fine. Okay, um, okay, good. So I'm going to get started then. Yes, please do. And okay. I will go mute very soon. Sure, okay. So hi, everyone again. Uh, so my name is Dr. Tushar Mehta, okay? And I'm a physician. I'm a doctor in Canada. Um, here I practice emergency medicine. I've also practiced family medicine. And I've done some international health work. Um, for more than 10 years, I was working one month every year in rural part of India in Kutch. There's a hospital called the Bidra Sarvadeya Trust Hospital. And um, <clears throat> also I've done some environmental work, uh, including uh, with Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, but also participated with some other organizations. And uh, I'm also vegan for the past seven or eight years. And I study about vegan diet and health. And I study about um, the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. I'm also very interested in Jivdea, uh, that is compassion towards animals. And that was my initial interest, you know, to not cause any harm. But in the meantime, I also learned about the health benefits and about the environmental benefits as well. Okay. So I'd like to share the idea about veganism, which you know, a lot of people thought was a very fringe thing, but now people are realizing it's coming more and more into the mainstream for a lot of good reasons, okay? So when we're talking about the environmental impact of animal agriculture, one of the first, you know, well, well, for many years, people knew that it took more land and more lot, water and everything like this to get animal foods as compared to eating plant foods. This is a long time knowledge. But the first document to really put a lot of scientific literature together under one umbrella is something called Livestock's Long Shadow, written by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Association, and, uh, or the UN Environmental Protection Agency, sorry, UNEP, okay? And in 2006, and they took all kinds of scientific data and put it into one big document. And this was the first sort of very large scale assessment and universal assessment, uh, bringing together science about the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. So a lot of key statistic, statistical analysis and uh, global, global analysis was done. So this was like a blockbuster document. And I encourage everybody to download this document, it's free. It's a lot of pages, it may be four or 500 pages, but there's an executive summary, which might be just be 10, 12 pages, which summarizes the information in the document. And that's a really good thing to read through and you can show other people as well. Okay. So what did this study tell us? What did this document tell us? It talked about how animal agriculture turns out to be the number one cause of worldwide deforestation. The first number of cause of wetland loss, grassland changes, soil erosion and desertification. Desertification means that you, you do agriculture on a land to such an extent that there's a lot of soil loss and what is something that's green or semi-green, like semi-arid, turns into desert. It's the largest cause of freshwater consumption, extinction of land animals, fish, and the, maybe the first or second largest cause of climate change. Uh, there's a lot of use of antibiotics, nitrogen, phosphorus, and everything like that going into the water. So why is it the number one cause of all of these things? Why is it such a big cause of all these things? Now, has anybody seen the movie called Cowspiracy, by the way? Can anybody put up their hand if you've seen the movie Cowspiracy? Tell me about that. Can you put up your hands? Uh, is the, is the, uh, does the presentation show that? Um, let's see. Okay. Well, there's a movie called Cowspiracy. And I recommend everybody to watch this movie because it talks about the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. So it's a great movie. And if you go on the website of the movie, then you can see the um, studies that they're quoting. Okay, they give it all, they list all of their references. 
So they're not just giving you information, but they're really giving you all the references so you can look at the scientific papers and studies yourself and see what's there. Okay, and that's a very important principle. Okay, uh, whenever I talk about something, I want to make sure that I share my studies too, and I'm going to do that as well for you. Okay, so the main problem is that okay, so animals are fed in order to then produce meat, milk, or eggs, right? Animals first have to be fed. There's two main, main ways of feeding, feeding them. One is by providing grains, soybeans, lentils, oil seeds, or food stuff that is grown through agriculture. So we grow the food to feed the animals. That's number one. And number two is grazing. What they do is the animals just eat grass on the land, grasses and those kind of things on the land. But most of the land in most of the world is not a grassland. Most of the world contains a forest or a wetland or even if or some brush or even if there is some kind of uh, a grass there, it's not the same kind of grassland as what the uh, animals are going to eat. So the land has to be converted to from a natural land into something that humans control in order to feed animals. Okay, so this is called land use change. Whenever we take natural land and we farm it or we do grazing on it, we're changing the characteristics of the land and the biodiversity and the things that grow there. That is called land use change, all right? Now, there's something called a feed conversion ratio, okay? Everybody knows that if I eat, you know, uh, a lot of food you know, over the year, if I'm eating, you know, let's say uh, one kg of food per day and in 365 days, I did not gain 365 kilograms. Most of the food is used for my personal metabolism. So my body requires energy for movement, for breathing, for maintaining the uh, temperature of the body, for cooling the body, for creating proteins that are part of all the enzymatic processes and all the pro bodily processes. That takes energy, that takes protein all the time. Our body uses fat, carbohydrate, and we also use protein as fuel. We convert these things into, um, uh, into fuel so that we can do our bodily processes, okay? So we're, we're even metabolizing our protein. So it takes a certain amount of protein to convert into, into the flesh. If somebody's growing, you know, obviously there will be gaining weight, but only a certain percentage will be converted into the flesh. Now for chickens, it may be four to six kilograms of plant protein to make one kilogram of you know, chicken, chicken protein. Really, it says chicken flesh, but it should be chicken protein. Um, and you can see also for, for pigs and for cows and also for milk and eggs, it takes three or four kilograms of protein to get back one kilogram of protein. And that's a feed conversion ratio. How much do we feed and then how much do we get back? And there's an inefficiency there, right? If I was to con consume, let's say, lentils like mung or some kind of dal, we grow one kilogram of protein and I eat one kilogram of protein. But with these kind of foods, you're losing 75% or more of the protein and the calories. Uh, the calories, it's even more ineff inefficient. You know, it takes a lot of calories to feed and then you get less back. Therefore, basically, you need to have more land, okay? To have, you know, to, to grow land to eat plant-based foods, you need maybe this much land, okay, to grow, you know, but you're gonna need, you know, this much land, much more land to grow animal-based foods in order to then give back to humans to eat. It's gonna take more land. To grow food to feed humans compared to growing food to feed animals, it's gonna take more water, okay? It's gonna use more soil. Our impact on the soil and pesticides, use of antibiotics and all of these things is going to be much more. Now, you know, in many cases, we also fish directly from the, um, from the oceans and from the rivers, and that's an, even another issue. But let's start with all these things on the land, okay? So when it comes to land animals, we consume over 65 billion land animals per year, okay? Per year, that's how many we can say. No, land animals are concerned, birds and cattle and um, uh, pigs uh, and goats and all of these types of animals. 65 billion worldwide is how much we consume, okay? And that means that 2,000 animals are slaughtered 
every second. These are very big numbers. And it's hard to imagine what means a billion, you know? But uh, that's what kind of uh, scale we're talking about. When it comes to fish, over one trillion are killed per year. It may be up to three trillion. It's difficult to estimate because what they do is they look at worldwide fish harvests. They try to get reports on all of that. And that's not always perfectly accurate. You don't have uh, data on every single thing. And then they look at the amount of tonnage that's taken out. And then according to that tonnage, they estimate by the type of fish and the size of the fish and so forth, what the numbers might be. There's also a lot of fish that people catch, but it's not legal to catch them. So they throw them back in the ocean after they're dead and caught. That's called bycatch or by kill. And so minimum one trillion, but up to three trillion fish per year. And that means from 30,000 to 90,000 fish per second are killed. So the numbers are incredible. Okay. Let's look at the world population of humans. Okay. Now this is very interesting. In 1800, we reached our first billion, and then it took more than 100 years to reach 2 billion. Within 30 years, we got 3 billion, and then since, uh, roughly every 15 years, we're adding 1 billion to the population of the Earth. In fact, between 2012 and 2017, we've already gained, you know, maybe almost half a billion people, right? In 2017, we got 7.4 billion people. So the next billion people between 2012 and when we get the next billion, it's gonna be 8 billion. It may be less than 15 years at the rate that it's going right now, okay? People estimate that the world population can go up to 9 billion. That's what people were saying optimistically uh, over the past few years. But now people are using the number 10 billion. But if you look at good, um, articles about the issue, it shows that the population can go, you know, after 100 years or so, up to 16 billion. So a low estimate might be 10 billion and a high estimate might be 16 billion. So that is a lot of people. We're going to talk about the problem of population a little bit more as well. Okay. But to feed all of these people, we're going to have to have an impact on the earth. And even growing plants to feed people has a large impact on the earth. But feeding animal products has exponentially more impact. Okay. It's, it, now, it's interesting to think about how, uh, what percentage of growth rate there is. Okay. So, you know, USA, Canada, Europe, you know, we grow at about 0.8% per year. Now, if you take numbers, the number 70 uh, and you divide it by a growth rate, you get the doubling time. So let's say if I have a bank account, okay, and I'm getting, let's say, 7% interest on my bank account. So I take 70 divided by 7, and I'm going to get the number 10. That means it takes 10 years to double my money in my bank account. If I'm getting 3.5% interest, then 70 divided by 3.5 is going to be uh, 20. So I'll have, uh, it'll take me 20 years to double. If it's 1%, if you grow by 1% per year, that means you double your population or you double your bank account in, uh, in, in 70 years, okay? Um, so it seems benign. If you have a 1% growth rate, it doesn't seem so bad. You know, it doesn't seem like a big number. But 70 years is not a very long time in terms of human history or in terms of geological or biological time frames. Okay. If you double the, if the wor world population grows at 1% and we're at 7 billion, and then we get to 14 billion in roughly 70 years, that's, that's a very, very large number. You know, that's a very, very large number coming in a very short time for the planet. Okay. So you can see that even a small percentage of growth rate, even if you grow at 0.5% per year, and that means you would double the population in 140 years. That's not good for the earth. The earth cannot sustain 14 billion people anytime, you know? So it's very important that we want to reduce world population as part of the problem uh, of our food situations as well. So this is, you know, all of these environmental issues, population, consumption, fossil fuel use, uh, material use, animal agriculture, all of these things taken together 
determine what's going to happen to the planet. Okay, so but animal agriculture is one of those factors, and we don't want to underestimate that factor because if you have a lot of people eating animal foods, it's going to be much worse than having a lot of people eating plant foods. Okay, now. There's uh, some very interesting statistics from a professor called Vaclav Smil. He is a Canadian professor from the University of Manitoba. Um, and through looking at Bill Gates' uh, articles, um, I uh, came to know about his book. And so he does a very interesting thing. What he does is he estimates the amount of animals and humans that there are on Earth and also how much of the Earth's capacity that humans are using. So they're looking at all of these kinds of things. So in the year 2000, if you looked at the weight of all the wild animals that are on the land-based animals, so land-based animals includes birds, you know, because they're above, uh, they're not in the ocean, they're, they're still land on the, uh, you know, come to, come, come to the ground. So look at land, you know, all the birds, all the frogs, we're talking about vertebrates, so anything that has a spine, okay? So we're not talking about insects or those kind of things, but every, every vertebrate animal, every snake, every frog, every elephant, zebra, tiger, um, you know, wild buffaloes, uh, and, and all those things. If you took all the wild animals and you looked at their weight, there'd be approximately 10 million tons of land vertebrate animals. But if you look at humans in the year 2000, there's 125 million tons of humans, just one species outweighing all the hundreds of other species. Okay. Now, the average weight they took of uh, a person was about 50 kilograms and looking at about 6.1 uh, billion people at the time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's coming out to like well, roughly, um, you know, 122 million tons, really. But if you took a look at all of the animals that humans controlled, so our livestock, okay, so all of our pigs, our chickens, our uh, cows, sheep, and goats, and everything that humans cultivated for their purpose, okay, all of these animals that humans controlled, one, 280 million tons of livestock, okay, this is considering the dry weight. We're just looking at the weight with water removed. He calculates things with the live weight, the weight with water removed. So you're looking at the biomass minus the water. And he also looks at the carbon weight, how much carbon is occupied. Okay. So that's, you know, so that's getting, you know, over uh, 400 million tons. If you're looking at, you know, close to 425 million tons of humans plus all of their animals worldwide, the dry weight in the year 2000. But we also know that in the last 30 years, the population of wild animals has been cut in half, okay, because of human activities, because we're, you know, cutting down more forests and occupying more land and all the other activities that we do, climate change and um, uh, pollution, uh, more farming, more pesticides, everything like that. We've cut the population of wild animals down. And we've also, uh, we've also, increased our own population, even increased our own body weight. So right now, uh, if you look at wild animals as a percentage of humans plus human controlled animals, they are less than 2% of the weight. So you can see the number is critical because originally when humans evolved, they were one out of thousands of species. And probably our biomass was less than 1% of the mass of all animals. But now, all animals combined are close to just 1% of the weight of humans and their, and their uh, human controlled animals. So, you know, talk about, you know, this is what I talk about to audiences over here, you know, uh, you know, how many kids should we be having, right? And, uh, and this issue of population control is very critical. It's a question that goes beyond just what we eat. Now, the Green Revolution occurred between the 1940s and 70s, and there was new genetic strains through crossbreeding of wheat, corn, rice. We got fertilizers, pesticides, machinery, irrigation. There was an energy boom because we got better at extracting fossil fuels. And, uh, and basically, many countries around the world that couldn't feed themselves, India was one of those countries, couldn't feed itself, became self-sufficient in food. Okay. And now in the 21st century, we have GMOs and new kinds of pesticides and chemicals as well okay, that are assisting the production of food. Norman Borlaug is the guy who uh, was this sort of genius behind the Green Revolution, breeding different kinds of wheat and rice, etc., that could 
have higher yield and resist diseases. And, you know, this was responsible for a lot of the different rice strains and wheat strains in India uh, that helped to make India self-sufficient in food. He's considered, he won the Nobel Prize and he said, you know, the man who saved a billion people, they call him. But he warned very clearly that if the population keeps rising, at some point we're not going to be able to feed ourselves properly. Now let's look at the genetic engineering of farmed animals. Breeding is the main type of genetic engineering, not GMO. We've been breeding animals for thousands of years, okay? For example, the red jungle fowl, it's a natural animal. Now by breeding this red jungle fowl for selected attributes, we get different species of chicken and many of them lay over 300 eggs per year, okay? and they grow abnormally fast. We see all of these different species of dogs. You know, people have all these, you know, bulldog and Daushan, the little dog that looks like a small, like a sort of like a hot dog. And we have, you know, huskies and all these different animals. None of those dogs ever existed in nature. Okay, there was no of those animals, a chihuahua. There's no wild of, uh, form of any of these animals. There was just some wild dogs. And through breeding and breeding and breeding for selective traits, in different places, they created all of these different breeds of dogs. We've done the same thing with chickens. We've done the same thing with pigs and cattle. This is why the pigs and cattle and chickens, they, they grow much faster than they would normally grow as any wild animal. They also uh, produce more eggs than any wild animal would do. Okay? This is not normal for a body to produce so many eggs because it drains the body so fast. Okay, and that's not the way evolution works. And, you know, uh, animals produce more milk and they're more docile, right? The different breeds of cattle. In fact, there was no such thing as a cow a few thousand years back. There was an animal called a Iraq. We bred that animal into different breeds of cattle. And the original animal, unfortunately, humans killed them all off and they are extinct. Okay, so uh, we've bred cattle, cows into existence, but they never existed naturally before that. Okay. All right. So now when we're growing all of these different breeds of animals, what we want to do is we either graze the animal in on, you know, on the land, or we bring them up in farms where we grow food and we feed them. Okay. Now to use the least amount of land and to grow the animal the fastest way possible is to use factory farming because the biggest environmental impact as I was mentioning before, is that we use up so much land, right? We're using up all of this huge amounts of land across the earth to grow animals, right? Because you have to, uh, because of grazing and growing food and the inefficiency that there is, right? It takes a very small amount of land if you're directly eating the, the food that's grown from the land. But if you're going to take, if you want to produce this much food through an animal, you have to feed the animal this much food and it's going to give you this much food back. Some things may be more efficient, but at the best, even for dairy, eggs, and chickens, it's going to take, you know, four kilograms of protein to give you one kilogram of protein back, or it's going to take you about nine or 10 calories, you know, to feed the animal to give you one calorie back to you. Okay, so that's not efficient. And for other things like beef, and then, you know, is, is the most inefficient. Okay, um, so you know, uh, if you are going to eat animals, if somebody is eating animals, factory farming is the most efficient. Why? Because you're feeding them more concentrated food. Also, you're not allowing the animal to move. In those factory farms, in those places, the animals are always chained up. They can't walk around. They're not burning calories. So they're, they're not converting their protein and carbohydrates and, and fats into... Uh, energy for just movement. They're just sitting all the time. They're just in one place all the time and you continue to feed them and you have these genetic breeds that maybe can't even walk that well, but they just grow very, very, very fast. Okay. Um, so it takes a lot more uh, land to feed an animal, to, to feed an animal, to feed a human. If you're grazing them as compared to factory farming, but, uh, you know, as compared, as compared to uh, eating plant foods, which is the most efficient. Okay. Now, I sent a document link that has some statistics about India, but you can say that in a place like USA or UK, you know, 
they use in USA they use seventy percent of the entire land of the continent is used for growing animals. Okay, and in the United Kingdom, it's like sixty percent. Worldwide, it's about one third of the planet. So we have about fifty percent of the planet of all land on the planet. More than fifty percent is under cultivation by humans. Okay, humans have farmed more than fifty percent of the surface of the Earth, the non-frozen surface of the Earth. But of that 50%, you know, two thirds is used for animal agriculture and one third is used for growing plant agriculture, roughly, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a, a massive amount of land of the entire planet. You can just imagine all the forests and everything that, that we had to destroy in order to use up that land for farming. And the most inefficient is by animal farming, okay? So that's crazy. So. And, and through growing animal foods, we get very little calories and protein as compared to plant foods. Okay. On the planet, 50% of all cereals, all grains on the planet, 50% are not fed to humans. 50% are fed to animals to feed back to humans. And more than 93% of all the soy is fed to animals, you know, in order to feed back to humans for animals or other purposes. Okay. Humans consume only about, you know, six or 7% of all soy directly for our foods, but most of it is used in that way. So that's inefficient. Okay. That's very inefficient. Right. If we were to, um, now this is just a case study of Mexico. So that I should make a case study of India as well, actually. Um, okay. Now this is a, just a, you know, some United Nations statistics. So 50% of all worldwide crops are fed to animals. 70% um, of all human uh, land use for agriculture is for animals. So all of the land that humans use for anything that we do, whether it's for mining or growing food or anything like that, 70% of all human land use is used for animal agriculture. This uses more land than anything that we do. Okay. That's why it's the number one cause of deforestation and all the other problems that we're talking about. And grazing uses far more land and is less efficient than factory farming. Okay. Now these, this is an interesting graph I, I can you can probably see my um uh um cursor here my arrow pointer okay so in terms of the mass okay so in terms of the mass of things that we use i wonder if i can move this here okay it's over here in terms of the mass of all things we use on earth you know um uh let's look at um the mass of animal products, we only produce this much mass of animal products, but it causes this much percentage of our global warming. You know, we'll talk more about that, but this much of our land, okay. To produce this much weight of products, we're using this much land right here. Okay. You see all that land that we're using. Okay. And in terms of the impact that it has on the environment of all the different things that we do, like mining, like iron and steel, like getting minerals, oil, natural gas, heating, plastics, this is the impact that it has as compared to the other things. It has a disproportionately large impact. It has the largest impact of any sector of human activity. When you were not just talking about climate change, but we're talking about impact on the land, water, climate change, everything combined. Okay. Let's go here. So, just disturbing for a moment. Uh, can you show the previous slide, please? Sure. And previous, probably. Kavit, is this good? This is the one you need to see or something else? Please write on the chat box. Maybe one more previous. Oh, yeah. One more okay. previous? Yeah, done. This is the one? Yeah, this is the one? Okay. Good. Okay. So you can take a look at that. And I'm going to share these references with you. So you can look at the original documents as well. Okay. You can find the original documents and, and I can share my slides with you as well. So you can also have a copy of all the slides if you would like to. Okay. All right. So animal agriculture worldwide land use. Um, so as I mentioned, 30% of the non-frozen surface of the earth used for animal agriculture. Okay. And, and okay. now what is the problem with grazing? Grazing seems like it's a very natural activity. You see animals grazing on the land. We have grown up with this imagery. However, it's not natural because the earth for millions of years did not have any 
animal controlled by humans. Humans were a very small, small percentage of the population of all animals. And now we're controlling, you know, you know, literally billions of animals. And, uh, you know, we have over a billion cattle, over a billion, you know, goats and sheep on the earth. And m many of them graze. To graze, we have to create the land for grazing. So we have to cut down the forest and turn it into a grassland. So originally, uh, there could be a forest. Now, in places like India and Europe, there have been forests that were there cut down maybe a thousand years ago or even, you know, 1500 years ago. We've cut down forests and we don't even remember what was there before we turned these things into a grassland or farmland. Okay. So we've cut down forests over the centuries as the human population increased. Grazing is the largest cause of deforestation because it requires the most land. The biggest cause of rainforest loss in the Amazon and in African rainforests and in other places. We drain wetlands to convert them into pasture. So it's the biggest cause of wetland loss. Forests and wetlands have very high biodiversity. So it's an enor enormous impact on all natural animals. Loss of grasslands. So when we are having a grassland. For example, there are areas around the world that are grasslands. Uh, much of Canada is a grassland uh, in parts of the US. But when we start grazing animals, the animals take the grass, the grass may be very tall, maybe one meter or 1.5 meter tall grass. And when the animals are going over this grass, and in that grass, you'll have snakes and birds and nests and all kinds of natural animals within those grasslands. When you start having cattle, they will eat up those grasses. They will make it from one meter tall into just this tall, you know? Then we will usually change the grass. We will change it from the kind of grass that they don't like to eat. And we will reseed it and put different types of grasses there that are preferred by the animals. And so we're changing the type of grass and we're changing the height of the grass. And these animals are walking everywhere. They're trampling and, and removing basically all of the natural animals most of the natural animals when we convert it into pasture land. Also, there is erosion when these large hoofed animals are trampling the land and eating the grass to very low levels. Then you start losing soil and you're getting erosion in those grasslands as well. Okay, and we'll talk about uh, that as well. So 20% of the world's lands are degraded by grazing. Grazing has such a big impact that the quality of the soil becomes permanently damaged by grazing animals. So it's a very big problem. And 70% of the lands that are, um, uh, uh, that are being grazed are dry areas. So the grass and the soil is kind of thin and it's not very strongly held to the ground, you know? But there's a natural cycle that's there for, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and that soil is developing. But these animals come in to eat that grass, they disturb that balance, and you start losing soil and degrading uh, much of these, um, these lands. So 70% of the lands that are grazed in dry areas are degraded. Now, to feed animals, as I mentioned, you have to deforest, you know, cause deforestation, and then you can either grow crops or grow grass for grazing. Okay. And soil erosion, so soil erosion occurs in two ways from animal agriculture. The first is grazing, as we mentioned, okay? So when we're grazing these animals, uh, you have compaction, you have deforestation. So once you cut the forest, the soil can be lost. You have compaction by the hooves. They eat the grass very low. So every time they eat the grass low, soil can start blowing away or going away with rain. You have replacement of grasses by different species of grass that may be preferred for eating. However, they, are, um, they may not hold the soil quite as strongly. Uh, water and wind then deplete the exposed soil. And, uh, um, this, you know, and then you get desertification is the worst form of erosion where you have these marginal lands, semi-dry lands turned into deserts and the biodiversity is lost. And soil takes thousands of years in many places to develop. And we lose those soil in just a few years and, and that's it. You know, it's a permanent kind of very long-term environmental damage. Now, also um, when we look at crops, that's the other way of, of um, that's the other way of 
uh, feeding animals. But the problem with crops is that we use the plow. The plow basically plows the land and cuts through the land and turns it over. Okay, and then we put seed in the land and you turn over all the oil, old stuff to decompose. But the problem with that is it exposes the soil and then rain and wind will carry away a lot of the soil every year. So plow based agriculture is the majority of the agriculture that we do to grow crops and it is causing soil loss everywhere in the world. Okay, and 50% of all crops are grown to feed animals. So this plow-based uh, uh, agriculture is bad when, even if you're vegan, it's causing soil loss, but definitely when you're eating animal foods, percentage-wise per uh, a kilogram of protein or per uh, you know, uh, thousand calories or whatever it is, per calorie or per gram of protein, you're losing a lot more soil because it takes more land you know, to, to feed an animal to then feed a human. Okay. So, Grazing, we already talked about, and the impact on um, soil and everything like that. Let's talk about animal waste, okay? Animal waste also has a really big impact on wildlife and ecosystems. So um, it, you know, there's animal waste going everywhere, it has various bacteria and everything like that that are bad for natural wildlife, okay? They also cause climate change gases and they, get, they contaminate the water. So a lot of the animal feces go into water. That happens with uh, grazing, but it's also even worse with factory farming. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. Also, different animals have different impact. A lot of these grazing cattle eat the eat, eat the soil to a certain eat the grass to a certain level, short. But things like goats and sheep eat the you know they pretty much eat right down to the roots, and so they cause even worse erosion when you're grazing with them. Okay, um, water use. Just, uh, just a question. There is. A Mm -hmm. the where should the domestic animals graze this is ruchika is asking you this question where should they graze mm -hmm. domestic animals well once you have converted the land once the land is already converted it's first of all good to graze animals existing animals it's better if they graze on existing lands okay as opposed to converting new natural lands so natural land. So cutting down a new forest to graze an animal is much worse than grazing them on an existing area. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, so we don't want to destroy natural habitats in order to graze animals. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, there are different types of lands, right? So lands where there are more lush, there's more, uh, let's say there's more rainfall and more, more grass, and then you can graze them uh, and graze them in lower density. For example, if you have a certain am amount of land, for, in, you know, in, in India, there's about um, over 300 million cattle in India. Okay. Now 300 million cattle, if they're grazing and being fed are going to have a lot of impact. But if we convert that to, if we, if we just decrease the population because we decrease the pregnancy rate because we control their pregnancies, right? And if we breed them less and reduce the number to 150 million cattle, then they're going to have a less impact because per acreage or per square kilometer per hectare, we're gonna have less number of animals, right? So decreasing the concentration of animals, grazing them on existing lands, and grazing them on the type of land where we feel that there will be less erosion is going to be better. So some areas are higher risk of erosion because they're more sparse, they're semi-arid or whatever it is. And certain areas can be, um, you know, um, uh, uh, lower risk for erosion. That's not always under people control because in, in local areas, you know, people are going to uh, just graze the animals with whatever land they have locally to them, right? So it's a partly we want to, when we have control, for example, in North America, we may be able to control these things a little bit better. In India, you just have small farmers wherever they are and it's harder to control everything that they do, right? So one of the things that we really wanna do is decrease the demand for animal-based foods like milk and increase the demand for more sustainable sources of protein. Like let's say we can replace animal milk with soya milk which has a higher amount of protein and is also healthier, but is gonna have a much, much less impact on land, water, and earth. 
still going to have an impact, unfortunately, because there's more than a billion people, you know, in India, and there's 7.4 billion people on the earth. Anything that we do is going to have an impact, but we want to try and reduce the impact to the lowest impact while also increasing our health at the same time. Okay. So, um, you know, water use, the largest use of water for uh, humans is for farming and 50% of all the crops that we use are for farming. So uh, we're draining a lot of our rainwater, our aquifers, rivers, lakes, we're using that for agriculture. And the, you know, and then when we try to, and then when we use that, um, when we use that for animal foods, we're actually going to be using much more water uh, because of the, you know, the conversion ratios. The um, amount of water it takes on average for a liter of milk in the most optimal setting is 1,000 liters of water, you know, when we're growing crops to feed to animals to then get milk, 1,000 liters of water to get, you know, one liter of milk, as opposed to, let's say, something like soya milk, where it's going to take maybe, you know, 200 liters of water to get one liter of soy milk, you know. Uh, so definitely plant-based foods because of conversion ratios are more efficient in terms of water. Okay. The actual amount of water depends on the type of land, the type of animal grazing versus factory farming. For example, grazing, we're not using water to grow uh, crops. So maybe in a way there's less water, but if we consider the amount of rainwater that's used, you know, that it also adds up. Animal agriculture causes water pollution. So all of these factory farms, they grow all kinds of, they get all kinds of feces and stool, right? Now in India, a lot of times with the grazing and small scale production, a lot of the animal manure is used directly in farming. So it's not necessarily um, as impactful, but in places where there are factory farms in India and in other places, a lot of the animal stool, you get huge, massive amounts of, animal stool okay and it turns into like lakes and then much of these things run off and contaminate river systems and kill all the fish in the rivers and they contaminate the land and then they run into the ocean and cause huge dead zones in the ocean as well okay so that's uh pretty bad and so there's very bad impacts on the ocean as all of this feces and everything like that goes into the ocean okay. now that may be less in some places of india more in some parts of India. And definitely it's a problem around the world, however, of factory farming. In India, factory farming is on the increase. When you have factory farming and you have massive amounts of stool produced in one area, it, you, it's not possible then to distribute that, that, that manure into farms. But with the local animal farming, a lot of that manure probably does go into the land. But there's a problem. When you have, you know, we, a lot of us get, you know, these different bacterias and we get sick, you know, when we get diarrhea when we're in India and places like that, because a lot of the animal stool contains E. coli and those kind of things, bacteria and parasites that can make us sick. And when those things get into the water, uh, just like if human stool gets into the water, it makes those areas contaminated and we get so many illnesses like diarrhea and those kind of things. And we always have to purify our water because it's contaminated. Okay. So animal agriculture is the number one cause of species extinction worldwide because we're using up so much forest, wetland, grassland, and all these kind of things. Other species of animals, they die. When we cut down a forest or we re replace a grassland, and we take a grassland and we start breeding our animals, those other animals uh, will die. You can only have a certain percentage when you have, let's say, a grassland, and let's say you have a certain number of birds nesting on that grassland. There may be let's say 10 birds per uh, hectare, you know, or there may be, you know, or even less. They cannot concentrate themselves higher than that. They're in balance with the nature around them, with the amount of food they have and everything like this. So if we take away half their land, it's not like the animals just move to the other part of the land. They may move, but then you're going to have, instead of, let's say you take a land with 10 birds per per hectare, you use up half the land to graze animals. So those other birds are driven away and they occupy the land, uh, the adjacent land. Then you can have 20 birds per hectare, but the land will only sustain 10 birds per hectare, hectare. So ultimately, a lot of those birds are going to die and the population is going to be lowered because it can only be sustained a certain amount per amount of land. Okay. So most other species are killed, especially when we cause deforestation, 
when we cause, um, do everything that we do, you know, the other species are destroyed, other animals are destroyed. When, we, when they lose their land, they're not going to survive. Okay. Um, and there are many diseases caused by animal production. We use so many antibiotics in factory farms and therefore we have a lot of antibiotic resistance. Most of the antibiotics in the world are used for animals and not used for humans because in factory farms, they're on all so close together that they pass around bacteria and illnesses and many of them are constantly dying. So to make them grow faster and survive under those factory farm conditions, we use antibiotics. And even in the rural farms, I've seen a lot of farmers when I'm in India give shots of antibiotic. Anytime their cow gets a fever or anything like that, they're giving antibiotics all the time. So we're getting antibiotic resistance. Things like swine flu, H1N1, those are avian flu, SARS, you know, that's a, a type of virus that was, that was causing a lot of deaths around the world. Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, and all kinds of diseases are caused by the breeding of animals and concentrating these viruses and bacteria. So those are things that affect human health. Okay. When we talked about fish and the oceans, I was talking about one to three trillion fish killed per year which means that it's 30,000 to 90,000 fish per second, okay, that we are killing from the oceans. That's incredible. And uh, when we're doing this, the United Nations estimates by roughly 2050, we're going to kill off pretty much almost all of the fish at current fishing rates in the world, okay? So it's incredible how fast we are killing everything in the oceans. You know, people say that, oh, maybe fish is more sustainable, but that's not true. It may be the least sustainable. And in the nets, in the hooks, in the, all the things that we use to trap uh, fish, whales and dolphins, sea turtles, birds, everything is getting caught. Everything is dying because of all these nets and everything like that in the fish. It's killing everything in the ocean. Okay. Um, and yeah. So humans are now powerful enough to target and take all life from the oceans with our advanced technology or with our sheer numbers. India, for example, doesn't have so many of those big, massive vessels that are using sonar and high technology to do their fishing, but they have a lot of local fishermen in small boats. But the population is so high and there's like, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these boats. So they are all combined effect is to really you know destroy and, and take all of the life from the oceans it's a very 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 powerful way to clear the oceans and it's one of the most threatened of all ecosystems when it comes to climate change the united nations uh livestock's long shadow estimated that 18 percent of all global warming gases were caused by animal agriculture the main cause of this is deforestation so when we clear the forest okay or if we drain a wetland, there's a lot of biomass there, a lot of the dead trees and everything like that. They're going to be decompose or they're going to be burnt and that's going to release CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's one of the biggest cause of CO2 release into the atmosphere. As well, we're going to, uh, the decomposing feces, uh, decomposing trees, decomposing biomass from these deforestation, releases nitrous oxide and releases methane which is very, very, which are very, very potent climate change glass gases. Now, ruminant animals, such as sheep and goats and cattle, cows and buffaloes, they release methane through their burping. So when they burp, they release methane. It's not through farting, it's through burping, okay? And that is the largest cause of human methane. And then there is uh, an updated figure, the United Nations now says, okay, it's not 18%, Maybe it's 14%, but there's a lot of controversy. It depends on, you know, sometimes they may not include all the factors in this number. They may be missing a lot of factors. And the way you calculate the impact of methane and those kind of things uh, is also uh, can be done in different ways, you know. So they're doing it in a way that's a lower estimate. But it can be up to 51% if you include many other factors that they're not including here. So the number is somewhere in between this. One of the numbers that they use in this 15%, there's the World Watch Institute. Um, they made an estimate of uh, 51%. But if you, they also included the CO2, the carbon dioxide from animal breathing, from respiration. So if you don't include the respiration, then maybe it's going to be a lower number, maybe in the 30% uh, range or something like that, according to these guys' estimates. Okay, so these are the different gases, you know, CH, methane is CH4 and nitrous oxide is 
uh, NO2. And, uh, you know, this is climate change also affects the poor people of the world and future generations much more than current, you know, generation of people. So that's very important to notice as well. Okay. How do we feed the future uh, national and world population? Okay. So population will increase uh, before we learn to stabilize it. Um, and, but in the meantime, we don't want people to run out of food, right? And food security is an issue. It, in many places, right? If we took the current land that is used for animal agriculture, and instead, we just took the animals that, the, sorry, we just took the food that we we're growing to feed animals, directly fed that grain to people, we can feed an extra 4 billion people. If we just took the, took the food that we're growing today and feeding to animals, and then feed it to humans instead, right? Because we are currently feeding 50% of the world's grown food to animals. Now, it's not as easy as just converting that food uh, from, from animal use into human use. We know now, right now, even today, there's already enough food to feed everybody, but there are still far starving people. That's also because of a lot of maldistribution, uh, the different economic systems that we have, and, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of food justice issues as it is uh, because we, we, we grow enough food, but we just don't distribute it in a way to the, get to the world's poor people, and it's not a fair system. Okay. So uh, look at the amount of 90% of the world's you know, soya fed to uh, animals, 50% of the world's crops, 30% of the world's grains, you know, 30 to 40% of the world's grains. World hunger can be solved. There's enough grain and protein to feed everybody if it was just directly eaten by humans. Now, to, in addition to this, 30% of the world's food is also wasted um, because it goes bad before it reaches market. In India, a lot of times they grow food, but in the transportation storage and everything like that, you lose 30%. Or in North America, most of the food gets to the market. We are good at transporting and storing food, but if the food doesn't look, you know, if there's tomatoes or apples, they don't look so good, then nobody buys them. And when we bring them to our home, even at home, we waste a lot of food in North America. So that's a lot of waste. So 30% of the food in the world is already wasted. We need to take care of that. But, you know, when it comes to animal food, uh, we're wasting um, like uh, more than 70, 80, 90% of the food because of the inefficiency in growing. Okay. Um, okay. Biofuels are also a problem because people are taking a lot of natural food like corn and other things like that and using them for biofuel. Global conflict is also caused by many of the environmental problems that we have. So wars in Burundi, Congo, Somalia, Sudan, these, you know, these many of the conflicts in Arab countries, in Syria and those kind of things. Climate change and food security are one of the major factors that have caused different populations to go and fight each other. They already maybe have some ethnic tension or historical or religious tension or something like that. But then you add the factor of um, climate change and one of the groups maybe who is more disadvantaged is having more, you know, having higher food prices and harder to get food, then it's a trigger, one of the triggers for them going into war. Okay. So I just like to end off in terms of talking about um, the, um, you know, intelligence and compassion uh, that we have, you know, uh, and that there's a humanitarian aspect of kindness towards animals, but also the importance of um, the environment and um, health. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about, so, you know, in summary, um, you know, animal agriculture takes more land, more water, less efficient food production. It's a threat to uh, global hunger and food security, and it causes some of the most global warming. Definitely the biggest cause to lose biodiversity and also causes various diseases and contributes to human conflict. That's a, those are the summary of the impact of animal agriculture. Remember that this does not occur in isolation. Our economic systems, our overconsumption of other things, our energy use, our overpopulation, all of these things are also factors. But when you combine these factors, when you combine animal agriculture with overpopulation, then you're really, really in trouble. Uh, and, and that's why there's a, there's a big threat uh, to planetary health right now. Okay. Um, I also like to mention that um, um, I, I hope that most of you can see my video. I have a video 
called dairy production and cow slaughter in India. And that's a very important um, video to watch uh, so you can understand the concept. Uh, let me look what time it is right now. How much time do people have? I can very quickly go through those PowerPoint slides. Um, if you want, what's, what's everybody like? Or do you want to just ask, answer some questions and I can give the link to the YouTube video that I want people to watch or, and you can support it by yeah. WhatsApp as well. <clears throat> so there is a question for you. Uh, it says, I tried contact any evidences of such reservoirs in India. Uh, I tried contacting Goshala because that is one of the likely sources, but unable to get any reliable info. Uh, it is in contest of what? I don't know. Reservoirs for... Right, I'm looking at that. I know what you're talking about. You're mm. talking about... Um, you're talking about the reservoirs of animal stool, right? The yeah. animal... Animal... Um, combined animal stool that goes into big, big reservoirs. This is... Um, going to occur when you have large scale factory farms. Okay. Mm. Most of the goshalas, they are smaller. They're not going to produce that amount of stool that's going to cause a reservoir. Okay. Mm. Uh, right. The cow dung you just mentioned. So they're not going to con con you know, have that. But in Canada, for example, we have animal farms or the Canada, US, Europe, you know, we have these farms where you have literally thousands of animals, you know, thousands of animals and the, the, um, the reservoir they create is enormous. You have these animals with these farms, with pig farms, and you know, they may have like 10,000, 20,000 animals, you know. Now the largest Goshal I see has 2,000 cows. That is gonna produce a lot of stool. I think, you know, uh, it, it may or may not be a problem. First of all, is all of that stool close to a water source? And many times in Canada, US, Europe, those large factory farms, they put it close to a water source. Uh, we have more rivers and everything going around. And then we use that water source to feed the animals. And it, they also use that water source to help dispose some of the, the feces that they have there, okay? Um, you can see the movie Cowspiracy and this will tell you about it. 2,000 cows is a lot, but I think you can just sort of see what they're doing. I think in India, the Goshalas, tend to have better waste management, um, tend to have better waste management as compared to other things. These Goshalas actually have very good practices of taking care of animals as compared to uh, um, factory farms, okay? They do, they, they're, they're better. And they also have, you know, so, so they may be drying it out, spreading it around and putting it into farms and stuff like that. But if that Goshala is close to a river, or close to any water source, they may be piling it up on the ground somewhere. But also remember that all of that stool in the rainy season, it's gonna get rained on. And the bacteria from that stool is gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground and go into the groundwater. So the bacteria from that thing, like E. coli and stuff, will contaminate deeper groundwater in many cases that you may not see on the surface. So you have to also know where there's the water table Okay, and at what times of the year, what, you know, bacteria and water from rain is going to go down to the water table, taking with it the bacteria. And that's why in many cases, even though people are pumping water from the ground, you can't drink that water so easily. You have a higher chance of getting sick because parasites and bacteria are still contaminating groundwater that's deeper in the ground. India has, you know, so, and groundwater issues and water issues you know, different from, are different from location to location. Now, Peter uh, is asking about how they deal with animal stool in the USA and Canada. So in factory farms, they have huge, huge, you know, because we have such, our factory farms may have not just 2,000, we have, we have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 animals in a factory farm, you know, sometimes maybe even more. And there may be some factory farms that are close together right um and not spread apart so the stool goes into like large lagoons okay because there's so much of it now this lagoon is going to pollute the thanks mom uh the, the lagoon is going to pollute the groundwater okay uh, but in many times there is surface water that's nearby and sometimes it just sort of seeps into the surface water or directly it's put into the surface water just to get rid of it because there's so much in some cases, what they do 
is they have machines that liquefy this thing and then they shoot it up into the air, okay? And so as it goes into the air, it sort of dries. There's a drying effect and then it lands back on the ground into a more dry form. So they try to reduce the water content um, by shooting it into the air. But must, much of this also becomes particulates in the air and it causes air pollution and local communities have higher rates of asthma and stuff like that depending on these kind of practices to shoot it up into the air to help it dry and reduce the, um, the, the sheer amount of this lagoon, which can seep everywhere. If you look at the movie Cowspiracy, or if you look at the, if you go on the internet and look at lagoons uh, from factory farms, stool lagoons or fecal lagoons from factory farms, you'll see pictures, you'll see pictures from the air. But this kind of things will happen in India too when they have bigger factory farms because India is moving towards more factory farms because people are eating more meat. You know, the, the meat consumption in India is increasing very, very rapidly. And to, to get the number of animals that people want to eat or to have the dairy amount of milk that people want to consume, they're going to have bigger and bigger factory farms. You know, um, I stay in Mulund. I have a family in Mulund, part of Bombay. And Across the road is a goshala. They have about 120 animals. Those animals are tied around the neck and they live their entire life in a very small area tied up around the neck. That's their entire life is there. And they're always making stool. And a lot of that stool is just dumped into the gutter. And the gutter goes to the ocean. So you know that you know, it's contributing to the pollution that's going into the ocean and all the other things, everything else is going in that gutter. The gutter is really bad. There's, it's a huge gutter and then there's plastic and all this black liquid, it's terrible, you know? Uh, so, you know, animal stool in the cities or places can also contribute to water pollution on the surface and eventually go to the ocean too. I mean, um, that's, you know, um, kind of a summary, but you know, there's so many more details and locally in every case, you can find out what's going on. Whenever you overconsume something, there's going to be some bigger or smaller impact on the environment, you know? Okay, so um, great, thank you for the questions. Uh, any other questions that you have, or can I, how much time do we have? Do you want me to show you very quickly a few slides about um, dairy production and cow slaughter in India? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna go to, let me just see here. Um, just talking about some compassion. Let me just talk really briefly about health, okay? Really briefly about health. Now, because I'm a doctor and I study the impact of plant-based foods on health, my next presentation is gonna be about dairy and health, but really what I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna actually go through um, vegan diet versus animal foods for health. That's what I'm really gonna talk about, not just dairy, okay? Now, you have the food groups, right? We have beans and legumes, we have grains, we have fruits, we have vegetables. We have also, I should add to this picture, some nuts and seeds, okay? And we have healthy fats, like a little bit of olive oil, a rapeseed oil or canola oil, that's another type of oil, flax oil. I think flax is called arnsi, you know? Some healthy fats like that. Now, those are our food groups. If we eat from our plant-based food groups in a very healthy way, you know, that is the best thing to reduce the amount of diabetes and reduce the amount of heart disease that people suffer from. You can see India has a lot of vegetarians. Um, maybe 30% oh, of India's population is vegetarian, but they still get all this diabetes. They're still getting a lot of heart disease and all these kind of things. And that's mainly caused by the animal foods. Vegans can still get these problems. I'm not saying vegans can't get those problems, but we can reduce those problems a lot especially if we have a healthy vegan diet, because you can eat kurkure, you know, and you can have thumbs up, and maybe that's vegan, but it's not good for you. It's gonna cause diabetes and heart disease, right? But if you're eating really the whole foods, then we're good. So these are the type of foods that we should be eating, and especially a lot of times in India, people depend on dairy products to get their protein, and I know Gujarati people, because I'm Gujarati, we eat dal, but we, it's like 95% it's like water and 5% dal. Like we actually have to eat more of lentils. Like, but I know in Punjabi culture, people who are vegetarian, if they eat like uh, rajma or chole, they have a big plate of rajma and chole. And you know, that's gonna give us a lot more protein. So we consume our protein from whole grains and, uh, you know, and, and, and through these pulses 
it's going to be really good. Um, well, here's uh, Harsha has a question. Recent reports have projected that Indian meat consumption is expected to raise by 76% in 2050. Exactly. Yes, those are the type of statistics we're looking at. And uh, those are the things that we want to change. Uh, can fats from plants also cause diabetes? The answer is yes. Okay. So if you're eating too much fat, if you're eating too much sugar, if you're eating too much starches, too much, then it can also cause diabetes and heart disease. Okay. But if you're eating a small amount of the healthy fats, you know, then that can be, that can have a small positive effect, but you have to have a small amount, but animal fats are much worse. Animal fats are much worse than the healthy plant-based fats. Okay. So that's what I, and there's, you know, unhealthy plant-based fats include things like palm oil, um, and, and maybe some of the things like uh, safflower oil and stuff like that are not as good. And coconut oil, everybody these days all over the internet think that coconut oil is great for you, but that's not true. Uh, there is evidence that coconut oil increases cholesterol and has effects on the heart, you know, more so than other plant-based fats. Okay. And it's sort of close to the, maybe not as bad as some of the animal fats, but it's, you know, also has a lot of problems in clinical research. Yes, they do have a high content of saturated fats. That's one of the main reasons that coconut oil is bad. The saturated fats, and they also have some medium chain triglycerides and all these kind of things that look good in a test tube research. But in clinical research, when you, when you see what happens to humans who are eating these foods, at the end of the day, it's raising their cholesterol and causing some more of these problems. So be careful about eating um, you know, things like coconut oil as well. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Jay is asking, uh, can you briefly give an ideal diet chart for an office goer? Uh, oh, talking about work involves being 10 to 12 hours a day and walk for an hour. Uh, over a half an hour daily. Good. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So we'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll mention that briefly. I'm not going to give you a long answer because um, this is more of a um, talk about uh, environment, but I have a talk online about plant-based diet and health. So if you are, let's say somebody who is an office goer, you want to make sure you eat all of your food groups. So we eat, what we like to say is we like to say whole fat, sorry, sorry, not whole fat, whole food, low fat, plant-based diet. Okay. Whole food, low fat, plant-based diet. That's going to be the optimal diet. So whole foods means instead of eating like um, refined foods. So if you have white flour, that's not a whole food. But if you take a grain and you grind it into a flour and use entire part of the grain, that is a whole food. White rice is not a whole food, but brown rice is a whole food. Okay. Uh, when we have fruit juice, like orange juice, that's not a whole food. When you eat the orange, that's a whole food. But orange juice contains a huge amount of sugar, you know, from several oranges, the removal of all the fiber and those, those things. So we want to eat whole foods. We want to eat lots of pulses. Definitely eat lots of pulses. Okay. That should be, a, we should eat much more pulses than most people do, even in India, who eats more pulses. Um, things like soy milk and things like that are very good, but not the sweetened, not with a lot of sugar. Tiny bit of sugar is okay, but things soy milk uh, with um, um, very low sugar content. So not the flavored soy milk so much. Okay. Uh, so those things, that's also a pulse really. Okay. And then we eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Now in India, we have the habit to cook the vegetables so much that it's just, you know, you lose all of the color you lose a lot of the vitamins, minerals, fiber is degraded too much. So we should cook things kachapaka, okay? That's the best way to cook things. So cook things semi-cook, okay? Don't overcook, all right? That's a very important concept. And eat fresh and raw, like kachumbar and stuff like that, okay? Um, so that's also very important too. You don't have to have everything raw, but some percentage of raw food, some percentage of semi-cooked food is very good, our sabji and stuff like that. We should not add so much oil. Indian people eat put so much oil in the food. That is, we eat way too much oil, okay? So we should really reduce the amount of oil that we use. A small amount is okay, but we're using crazy amounts, okay? And uh, we should not eat fried foods. So all these farsan that Gujarati people love to eat, the base ingredient may be good, using chickpea flour and lentils and pulses and grains and things like that, but then we fry it. So that's not good. Fried foods are bad, okay? And then we want to have, um, you know, some of our fruits and vegetables and whole grains, you know, whole grains. We should switch to brown rice in India. 
and that's much better for us as well. And, and whole grains for our rotis, chapatis. And we have so many ancient grains. You know, sometimes in India, you can make these chapati with a combination of, of different grains of wheat and then different other ancient grains too. The chapati is a little bit thicker and uh, more coarse. And it's amazing. That's going to be so much more healthy for us. But people sometimes like these very, very soft chapatis and they put a lot of oil inside the, the, um, the dough, you know, uh, and things like that. Those are not good habits. Okay. But the more chewy, thicker chapatis are actually going to be good, or better for us. Okay. There is a huge, you know, so that gives you an indication. And then as an office goer, the idea is you don't want to overeat your calories, stay low fat. And if you're a farmer, you might eat 20 chapatis, but if you're an office worker, you might only eat two or three chapatis. It depends how much calories you're burning. Okay. Pulses, you can generally go unlimited, but you know, oils and carbohydrates, you want to keep according to the level of your calorie expenditure. And you can look at yourself in the mirror, and you can know if you're too skinny, you can eat more, and if you are too fat, you can eat less, okay? Now there's a huge rise in Alzheimer's. How does a plant-based diet help with that? That's a very good question. Uh, that's Ruchika asking that question. And, the, um, and there is evidence, there's a lot of evidence that when our blood vessels get more narrow, Okay, our blood vessels, especially our arteries. So arteries pump blood from the heart to the organ. Okay, when we get narrowing because of cholesterol in our arteries, um, in the heart, then we're at risk of angina or we're at risk of getting a heart attack. But we also have these blood vessel diseases in all parts of our body and it's part of the aging process. When we have narrowing of the blood vessels in our brain, we start cutting off oxygen to all the little parts of the brain where these vessels get narrowed. And that contributes to Alzheimer's disease. It may not be the only cause, but it's one of the causes. We call it vascular dementia. There's a blood vessel component to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. In most cases, there are different kinds of dementias. Alzheimer's is one of them. And probably one of the causes of Alzheimer's, one of the causes of Alzheimer's is blood vessel disease. So we have a, if we have a healthy plant-based diet, because like I said, you can have a plant-based diet with too much sugar and refined flour and fried foods and too much oil. That's not a healthy plant-based diet, okay? But if you have a healthy plant-based diet, then you can prevent these blood vessel diseases and hopefully we can reduce the amount of Alzheimer's. There are some studies showing that the cholesterol that you have during your life, if you have high cholesterol in the middle of your life, if you have higher blood sugars, if you have diabetes, if you drink more milk, there's a study that came out recently that people who are drinking more milk are having more Alzheimer's later in their life. Again, because the saturated fat and animal protein is having an impact on our blood vessels. That's probably the biggest cause. There may be other causes too uh, with regards to that. But instead of that, if we got the same amount of protein from soy milk, again, not a sugary soy milk, then we're gonna be better off. So I really promote soy milk. Now remember, one of the big things to remember is that we need to get vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is critical, okay? If you're having low B12, that can also increase some of your cancers and increase some of your heart disease. Now, B12 is a bit cheap, is very cheap in most of the world, but in India, it's a bit expensive. But very soon, I'm hoping within the next year, there's going to be a very cheap and good quality B12 coming out because I'm really trying to push one of my friends who has a pharmaceutical company to make a very low cost B12 and he's made it, but now we just got to get it into the market, okay? So that's going to be good news for vegans, but it's good news for everybody because a lot of people, even the meat eaters in India and everywhere in the world, many people have low B12. Uh, are B12 tablets vegan? So B12 itself is made by bacteria, okay? So no B12 comes from an animal. All B12 comes from bacteria. That's the only source of, of vitamin B12 in the world, okay? and so they're in the soil, they're in the water and everything like that. But now we filter the water, we wash our foods, our soil may be depleted because of chemicals and things like that. So we're, we're not getting B12 so much in water and soil and those kind of things. We're not getting the B12 like that. In, the, in these um, places where they make B12 in the laboratories, what they do is they grow this bacteria and then they filter the B12 out of that, um, out of that uh, you know, concoction. And B12 is actually very cheap. It's very easy to make. And so it's, it's, it is um, vegan, but it does use bacteria, okay? And just like yogurt, yogurt is all bacteria, okay? So we're, we're just taking a different kind of bacteria, one that makes a lot of B12, and we're filtering the B12 out of it, okay? So that's 
how B12. Now the actual capsule, if somebody takes the B12 and they put it in a gelatin capsule, then it's no longer vegan, right? But we wanna make sure we buy it from a source that is hopefully not using animal products in the production of the capsule, okay? Um, and how much do we need? I would say we need 1,000 micrograms. We try to get a 1,000 microgram tablet and you have it once or twice a week. You can just have it once a week. You can break a 1,000 tablet, 1,000 microgram tablet, you can crush it and put it in your food and the whole family can eat it, okay? And you do that twice a week. You know, it doesn't have to be very expensive. Check the B12 once every couple of years, okay? You know, maybe do it once every year for two years. And if your B12 level is low, then check it again in six months after you start replacing the B12. And then see if it's normalized. Um, so start replacing the B12. And then after that, just maintain. You, know, you don't need super high levels of B12. You just need to be in the normal range and that's it. Having too much B12 may be a problem. In most cases, if you overdo any particular nutrient, it can lead to a problem. And there's a tiny bit of evidence that too much B12 may be a problem. But generally speaking, if you just go into the normal level, it's pretty easy. It's not for, it's, and then it's going to be cheaper and, you know, and that's going to be fine. You do not need B12 injections. A lot of times people think that they need B12 injections. Nobody needs an injection of B12 to be healthy. Okay. So there's a few, few tips about um, uh, you know, a whole food uh, low fat plant based diet. Okay. Um, I think that should cover the basics. Okay. Uh, so now, now let me, this is the What's liquid that? B12 that you were trying to develop. That's right. Yeah. I didn't develop it. My friend developed it. You got the bottle right there. We're yeah. going to try and get this into the market. My friend is so busy in his company with many other projects and he hasn't gotten this B12 into the market. But my goal when I come to India this year is to force him to get this thing into the market because it is very necessary for um, um, it is very necessary for people. You know, B12 absorption is quite variable between people. So I have people in my practice in North America, in Canada, you know, that they're eating meat and they're eating eggs and they're having lots of dairy products and they still have a low B12. There's other people that, you know, don't really, you know, they're vegan and they, they don't, uh, they're not even taking any extra B12 and somehow they're normal. So there's such a variation between people. It's like some people have need glasses and some people don't, you know, some people are nearsighted, sighted, some people are farsighted. I mean, if you need glasses, you need glasses. So I just tell everybody to take a supplement and that way we know we're going to be okay because we don't want low B12. That's, there's various health problems associated with low B12. Okay. Now let me just show you the other slide very quickly. So show very quickly that I was just taught. before that. There's a question uh, here on yeah. the chat window that says that soy milk is supposed to be detrimental for men to an extent. And what do you have to say about that? So okay, good. I'm just looking for the question. Here. Yeah, I'm just looking at that. That's a very good question. Thank you for that question. Okay, so um, so uh, the thing with soy is that soy is a pulse, okay? Soy is actually a, uh, it's a lentil, all right? And um, um, let me just, I'm just trying to get out of this PowerPoint here. How do I get out of the PowerPoint? Uh, somehow I can't, uh, okay, I'm gonna close this PowerPoint. Let me just get the other um, presentation up and running, okay? okay. So I'm closing that one and making sure that I don't accidentally turn off the zoom while I'm doing this. Okay, Dropbox. Okay, and I'm gonna look for my, mm, let's see, file here. I'll give this file, vegetarianism. As you can see, I have like so many different files. Um, Let's see. So usually the soy milk in America might be from the genetically modified soya or okay. anything. So first of all, so soy is a pulse, okay? Mm -hmm. Soy is a pulse. Out of all the different pulses, it has higher amount of protein. It has kind of double the amount of protein as other pulses do, okay? And uh, so it's an amazing food and it also has other good qualities. Now, one of the things that soy has 
but other other foods also have animal foods and um, other pulses has something called isoflavones but soy has more isoflavones isoflavones have a tiny amount of um, they have a tiny amount of um, estrogen effect okay very very small estrogen effect so estrogen is a hormone it's a molecule when the estrogen goes into certain types of cells it triggers the cell to to do something okay for example it can go into a breast and trigger the cell to uh develop more breast tissue to develop the develop trigger the cells to develop more and increase the amount of breast tissue okay um like that. So this, this hormone can do many things. It has effects on the female body. It has effects on the male body as well. It would have an effect on children. So the way a hormone works is you have a hormone, okay, and it goes into a receptor in a cell. And then that receptor in the cell receives the hormone and then triggers some kind of an action inside the cell. Okay, that's how uh, hormones work throughout the body. And, this, and the uh, receptors can be... Re you know, located inside a cell or on the surface of the cell or, um, you know, as part of various mechanisms in the cell. Now, isoflavones have a very small uh, estrogen-like effect. So essentially, um, an isoflavone is um, a molecule that in some ways has a similar shape as an estrogen. So it's going to go into the estrogen receptor, okay? But the shape may be slightly different, okay? So it might go into the receptor but it doesn't fit 100%. So it, has a, it sometimes goes into the receptor and has an effect, but most of the times it goes into the re receptor and does not have an effect. So it may have 1 50th, 1 100th, or in some cases 1 1 1,000th or 1 10,000th the effect, a fractional effect of actual estrogen going into a cell. At the same time, when that isoflavone goes into the cell, maybe it's not fitting properly most of the time, not having an effect. And a real estrogen is now coming, real estrogen. Real estrogen will be blocked from getting there because there's an isoflavone sitting there and blocking a real estrogen from getting in. And therefore, you're actually having a negative estrogen effect. Now, even males have some estrogen in their body, okay? It's thought of as a female hormone, but even male men have some amount, a small amount of estrogen in their body. Okay, so uh, it's actually in many cases reducing the effect of estrogen or changing the effect of estrogen as it goes into different receptors and sometimes has an effect and sometimes, you know, very seldom has an effect, but in many cases blocking the effect of real estrogen. Okay, now the meat and dairy industry have taken this and they've blown it and sort of twisted this complex sort of idea. Okay. And they've oversimplified and said that soy has estrogen and therefore men who eat soy, you know, they're going to have, you know, they're going to lose their libido. They're going to lose their testosterone. They're going to grow boobs. You know, men are going to get boobs and you know, they're going to be weak because they have all this female hormone that's having an effect inside their body. You know, other people have, and then they say that women who get too much estrogen can increase their chance of breast cancer and those kind of things. So they're going to increase their breast cancer and the women are going to have all kinds of problems. And then children are going to have problems because children are going to get all these hormones and they're not going to grow properly. You know, the women, the girls will have too much estrogen, boys will get estrogen, they won't grow properly. But all of this is 100% false. This is all marketing from the meat and dairy industry who are spending literally millions of dollars worldwide to give funding for this group and that group and pay all kinds of people to make these kind of YouTube videos, to write articles, to put it in the news, to make soy to look bad. Because soy is the biggest competition for animal protein because it's the number one source of plant protein and it's the biggest competition against animal protein. So that's why they're funding all of these you know, Tom, Dick and Harry and Sue and all these kind of people and the videos and articles are everywhere. But there's not one single medical paper showing that soy has any kind of estrogen effect that's measurable in a human being. There's not one, zero. I challenge anybody to find me one and bring me one. However, there is lots of evidence that people who consume more soy have lower cholesterol have greater strength of their bones as compared to people who drink milk in their later age. Okay, so when they get old, they have stronger bones drinking soy compared to drinking milk. We have good evidence about this.
not just that we have stronger bones measured by bone density, de bone density machine, that they have less fractures, they have less broken bones, okay? Also, uh, soy reduces breast cancer. People were afraid it's gonna increase breast cancer, but it reduces breast cancer, and it also reduces prostate cancer, maybe 20 or 30% reduction. It doesn't reduce it to zero, 20 or 30% re reduction. And one more thing ever, oh, sorry, one more thing also is that um, animal foods contain real estrogen. They actually contain real estrogen. You'll see this on the reference slides that I'm going to send you. They contain real estrogen because the cow, when the cow, any female is lactation, is in the phase of lactation, a human or any animal is lactating, they have a lot of estrogen inside their body. And that some of that estrogen goes into the milk. This is 100% animal estrogen, has a 100% effect in the human body. There is, um, there is, if you eat the body of an animal who is a female, when people eat meat of a female chicken, a female fish, or a female cattle, or anything like that, you're getting estrogen from that body, real animal estrogen, and you're eating it, and you're getting it into your body. And when you have eggs, which are developed, eggs are all developed in the ovary, of a female chicken and they absorb estrogen and eggs all have some real estrogen. That is the real estrogen that has a real effect. You don't see that all over the internet because there's not big industries spending millions of dollars, you know, spending millions of dollars putting this everywhere in the internet, but that's the real fact. In the emergency department, in, a, in the family practice, and even walking around India, you know, you see guys, you know, you see these fat guys with boobs. They kind of have boobs, you know, because they're so fat. That's actually real boobs. They're developing breast tissue. Part of the, and that's because they're getting estrogen in their body. Part of the estrogen, maybe just because if you're overweight. If you're overweight, you will get some increased estrogen in your body as a male, just because it's converted by the fat in the body. But also, most of these people are eating a lot of dairy and eggs or meat, okay? But the dairy has it too. So they're eating real estrogen. So that's the real problem when it comes to estrogen. And all of these things on the inter internet are just scare tactics, but there's none of it's true. When it comes to GMO soy, GMO soy is no worse than GMO wheat or GMO barley or any of the other GMO things that we're growing. It's no better and it's no worse. So I do prefer organic. But the research that shows that soy has beneficial effect on cancer, um, those are not done with organic soy. Those are done in China where they actually probably use a lot of pesticides and a lot of chemicals, a lot of fertilizers. Okay, it's not organic. And it's probably GMO as well because they use a lot of GMO there. But it's showing that people have less of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So the regular soy is beneficial. But if you have organic soy, it may be even more beneficial. So don't be afraid of soy, okay? I think a lot of these are scare tactics. They, these, these are scare tactics by the meat and dairy industry worldwide who are losing hundreds of millions of dollars when people start eating soy and they want to scare people away. And any other food that becomes popular, for example, almond milk is getting very popular in North America and Europe. So now you see all kinds of articles coming out showing that almond milk is not good for you or that it has a bad environmental effect, okay? So they're starting to do things. Anytime they have a competition, you know, Donald Trump is gonna say bad things about Hillary Clinton. He's gonna say bad things about Barack Obama, whatever, you know? Those are lies, you know, 90, you know, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know? And soy also does not have any bad effect on the thyroid. In fact, there is some evidence that soy decreases um, some of the, you know, the most common thyroid disease, which is just sort of low thyroid from what we call, um, you know, a low level of thyroiditis. Um, and that is decreased by soy. Okay. So, you know, not decreased to zero, but maybe decreased by 25%, 20, 25%. So again, you know, in a test tube, there's something about soy thyroid, but in real life clinical science, there is, um, good evidence that soy is very healthy. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, that's a good question about soy because soy is a very important food. I like the fact that in India we have so many beans and pulses and lentils and I want people to eat more of them, but I think that soy can also be part of these foods 
um, because it's, it's fantastic and soy milk can replace dairy milk. You know, the other plant-based milks like almond milk and stuff like that does not have any protein. So for stopping milk, we have to stay, eat a substitute food that has an equal amount of protein. So instead of paneer, let's have tofu, soy paneer. Instead of milk, let's have soy milk. So that make, make sure that if you're subtracting something from your diet, you're adding another protein source that's equal or better. In this case, it's better, okay? So that's what we should do. We should drink um, soy milk instead of dairy milk. Okay, so now let me see. Um, let, me, let me give you this. Uh, let me try this presentation right here. Okay. There's a question. Omega-3, I see it right here. Okay. Uh, I went through various... On the B12 tablets. No, there's something else after that. Omega-3. Oh, oh, yes, omega-3. Okay, so um, our anonymous, anonymous in attendee, hello. Um, I went through various studies on negative impacts of soy consumption by men. All of them are non-conclusive, including concluded that more research needs to be done. Yeah, there's a lot of small studies showing that, that you know, but there's definitely no studies showing any detrimental effect. But what, I'm going sh to share my, um, uh, my reference articles with you and look at for men, you know, there's all the stuff showing that there's no negative effect, that's for sure. But definitely look at the studies regarding prostate cancer, where they're showing that in the Asian populations who consumed soy since birth and consumed higher amounts of soy, that, um, that uh, it was uh, beneficial for reducing prostate cancer. Okay. There's a bunch of studies showing that it reduces prostate cancer and also plant-based diet itself. Vegans get less prostate cancer, maybe like 30% less prostate cancer. So that's good because prostate cancer is a bad disease. When it comes to omega-3, that's another good question. I think all of you guys need to attend my lecture about nutrition um, because my next lecture, um, what's the date again, Rupa Ben? In November, um, I, I can't remember the date off, offhand but uh, we'll share that. And that is going to really go into detail on all the questions that you're asking right now. But omega-3, you know, basically from fish, um, initially they thought there might be some benefit, but when they studied the, when they did bigger studies, they didn't find any really good benefits from omega-3. There's maybe some questionable benefit, but, but it's very sketchy, okay? So, um, uh, so omega-3s from marine animals is, probably not so great, not, you know, not so important. Um, however, m uh, eating fish is full of mercury, PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, and other, other chemicals. Fish is the most toxic uh, food in the world. Even when you eat the fish that is considered safe on these rating scales, it's still like many orders of magnitude more toxic than any kind of other meat which is more toxic than plant foods, okay? Because they bioaccumulate, animals bioaccumulate toxins in their body, in their fats especially. Okay, so um, the omega-3 is probably not necessary. Now we do need some omega-3, but having some flax, having some olive oil, some soybean oil, and those kind of things will, you know, walnuts, nuts and seeds, gives us the omega-3 that we need. Now, plant-based omega-3 is different than animal-based omega-3, but our, and our body converts some of it. But a lot of the things that our body is doing, we just don't understand. And it seems to be fine to consume the plant-based omega-3s. I would just say, you know, if you, we should grow more flax in uh, India and eat more flax and put some flax seed in different foods that we eat because it is just so healthy, you know, has many health effects. It also gives us some omega-3s, but a lot of the other oils like soybean oil, canola oil, which is also called rapeseed oil, is also a good source of omega-3s, walnuts, nuts, seeds, and just Google vegan omega-3. Now, if you really want the omega-3, because some people believe in it, that comes from fish. Fish actually get their omega-3 from algae. Okay, they eat algae. That's the original source of the ocean marine omega-3s. Now, what we do in North America, we have, and maybe in India too, we can get omega-3, we can get bottles of omega-3 where they grow algae. Okay, they brew algae, just the way people brew beer in a big thing, they brew beer. They brew this algae and they get the omega-3 from there and they make it into omega-3 capsules. That is the only source of marine omega-3 that is completely 
free of toxins. There is no toxin. There's no mercury, no PCB, no of any of these things. But if you buy fish oil or any of those omega-3s from fish or eat fish, it's loaded with toxins. So that's, a, that's an important thing that we can still get those marine omega-3s through algae and therefore we can avoid, um, we can avoid any uh, of the toxins. Okay. Now let me just show you this thing really quickly. Um, and it's called dairy production and cow slaughter in India. This won't take very long. Okay. I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, and uh, also I think I might be having some guests coming. <laughs> All right. But so, so dairy production and uh, cow slaughter in India. Okay. Let's talk about this, this phenomena here. Okay. Now, okay. So that's me introducing myself. So now which country in the world is the first largest beef exporter in the world? And which is the country that is the second largest raw leather producer in the world? Who's that? And the answer is India. Okay. So this country where there's all these laws that protect cattle or cows, especially they don't protect buffalo so much as they protect cows. Why is it having so much leather and why is it having so much beef? Okay. All right. So, um, so let's look at some statistics. You can see that India in terms of its beef export, the four biggest countries are Brazil, Australia, United States in terms of the number one beef exporters in the world. India started here along this red line and it's going up and up and up and up and it's getting, it's like the number one beef exporter in the world right now. This shows, this other slide shows the herd slide. This is how many cattle are in India. So in 2002, you had about, you know, just like, you know, just, just about 290 million cattle. And then that went up to 300 million cattle. So cattle means buffaloes and cows, okay? Um, and, uh, oops, where's my cursor? There it is. And then it's going up and then the, the, the you know, the, um, the, the, the number, sorry, oh, sorry, this is the uh, stocks right here, these things, you know, the population 280 million going up to, you know, 320 million and still going up. Okay. These are statistics from the Indian government that I'm showing you here. Okay. Um, now this is the percentage that is slaughtered every year. Okay. So, you know, you have about 280 million. Okay. And the percent that's going towards slaughter in that year is roughly 6%. Okay. So 6% of 280 million is about, let's say maybe 17 million or so, right? Uh, 17 million slaughtered that, that year in 2002. Okay. Now, if you come to 2013, you have over 300 million, but the slaughter rate is higher now. Now we're slaughter like, slaughtering close to 13%, you know? So that's getting close to 40 million slaughtered in 2013 as compared to 18 million, double the slaughter rate, 40 million slaughtered, okay? Now this is legal slaughter, okay? This is legal slaughter. Legal slaughter, illegal slaughter is not counted and legal, illegal slaughter may be higher in percent, you know, higher than, the, le than the, the legal slaughter, okay? These are through legal slaughterhouses. So traditionally, there's a lot of people, I guess Hindus, you know, um, revere the cow and they think the cow is a very special animal and a higher status above other animals. Although, you know, um, I think many of us sort of feel that animals, um, if they're a cow or any other animal, should have equal respect, you know. But in reality, you have all this crazy animal transport and slaughter industry that's just huge now, okay? And these are illegal slaughterhouses, okay? There's just local illegal slaughterhouses. Okay. And Indian business, you know, um, is very pro beef export. They love this thing. Okay. But like, why are we having this problem of so many animals being slaughtered, even though many people don't water, even Hindu people who eat meat, you know, and, you know, I, I think if you look at globally in India, you know, a higher percentage of India of Hindus you know, sort of eat meat nowadays compared to the vegetarians, but they still don't eat beef, right? But still, why are we having so much slaughter? Okay, so let's look at the, um, let's look at the sort of root causes of what's going on, okay? So a cow lives, can live 20 to 25 years if you take very good care of the cow, okay? If the cow's well kept. An Indian cow can be impregnated at the age of 1.5 years. The Western breeds can be impregnated at the age of one year. Okay. Milk is only produced after delivery of the baby. 
Milk production starts high and significantly lowers after six to eight months. For some cattle, it's going to be lowering after just three or four months, and some cattle, it's going to be maybe going a longer time. You know, there's individual variations. They can be made pregnant again after three months of lactating. So while the breastfeeding is going on, while the lactation is going on, they can still be re-impregnated while still breastfeeding. That's very difficult for humans, but in cows, they've been bred to do this. And the pregnancy lasts nine months. So you could make a cow pregnant every 12 months. Nine months of pregnancy, baby's delivered, there's milk production, and after three months of milk production, you impregnate again, you're concurrently getting milk and having a pregnant cow, okay? So let's do some math, okay? So if you have year zero, there is um, uh, 10 cows. Let's say I'm a farmer, I'm taking up this business, and I'm making a farm with, um, with some cattle. I got 10 cows, and maybe I get a bull to impregnate the cows, or I use artificial insemination. Okay, so I take the bull and I just take the bull and I systematically you tie up the cow, they put them in kind of a cage and the bull will come in and impregnate the cow. You know, it's not really nice for the cow, but that's what happens, right? So in the first year, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have 10 babies. And on average, I'm gonna get five girls and I'm gonna get five boys. So, you know, and I'm gonna get six to eight months of milk production, so now my business is started, okay? Then the next year, I have to make them pregnant again in order to get milk again. So now another 10 babies, again, five boys, five girls on average. And again, the fourth year, I'll do the same. Now the next year, I'm gonna say, hey, you know what? These girls from the first year, they're old enough, so we'll use them as well, and we'll impregnate them using artificial insemination, or you can use the same bull. That bull is their father, but they'll still do that, right? They don't have any qualms. And now you're gonna have 15, 15 mums, Okay, and 15 babies. And the next year we'll impregnate the next set of girls. So we'll have 20 babies. You can see our population is growing pretty fast. And the next year I'll impregnate another of these uh, five and the total population of 25 births. And now I have a population of 100. So in six years, I've got, you know, um, you know a population of 10 to a population of 100. Now I had 90 babies that are born. 45 of them are male. Now the 45 boys, what do I do with them? If I'm feeding them and giving them water, it's a huge cost and it uses up a lot of my land. So basically, I don't have any purpose for them. We don't use them in the farms, okay? So they're useless. So most of the time, we're gonna find some way to get rid of these baby boys, okay? Now, even on my capacity, the amount of land I have can sustain 30 cows, but now I have 10 cows plus 45 female babies. So I have 55 and maybe I can squeeze extra 10. You know, in India, we can squeeze things into a smaller space. We squeeze so many people into a small car, you know, okay, I can have 40, you know, maybe 45, but 10, 15, I'm going to have to get rid of some of the baby girls too. So even they got to die or go somewhere, right? Now we call this exponential growth. Okay. This is called exponential growth. We have over 300 million, 30 crores cattle in India, okay? Every three or four years, if you impregnate all the females every year, let's say some farmers, they're rural farmers, they're not so perfect in their system, maybe they impregnate every two years, but still, every three or four years, you're gonna go from 300 million, you're gonna double your population to 600 million, okay? And if you did it again for another three, four years, you get more than a billion cows. But there's not enough land, there's not enough water, there's not enough food to feed that many cows in India, okay? You know, this is how much water they need, 100, you know, 50 to 100 liters of water per day to drink, plus so much food. Even if we cut down all the forest and we start grazing them and growing food, we can't feed 600 million, okay? Um, and, oh, Harsha asked a question here. Let me see what she said, Harsha. Sorry, guys. Um, Yes, I'm going to share the presentation with all of you guys. Okay, yes, and she has to finish share the presentation. Okay, so now the Panjapurs are fun, are full. So Panjapurs are fun. They have all these Goshalas and Panjapurs. You know, Jains like to run, run these Panjapurs, you know. I know that about the Jain population. But, you know, of all the Panjapurs in the entire India, maybe they have, you know, enough for, you know, less than 1% of all the, the cattle can fit there. But those cattle are living in the Panjapur. It's not like they can take 1% every year. 
it's populated with cattle. Those cattle are living a long time. So a, in terms of the new cattle that they can take, because all these babies are born and people want to get rid of the old cattle or get rid of some babies and give it to the Panjrapur, most of them are full. You're only going to take like a few thousand per year across the country, maybe 20,000, 30,000. If you're lucky, maybe like 100,000 or 200,000 new admissions can be there. But otherwise, it's mostly full with existing cattle. Okay. So India has the highest demand of dairy products in the world. People want to eat milk, yogurt, ghee, butter, ice cream, everything like that. So you have to have all of these animals being impregnated and impregnated and impregnated. And now in India, you are finding these factory farms. Okay, because they can produce even more and have more animals and more breeds that produce more milk. Okay, okay. So you know, um, you know, and buffaloes. Nobody cares about buffaloes. Okay, there's a lot less caring about buffaloes as compared to the laws protecting animals. So what happens if you have a farm and you're overloaded? Maybe some lucky farmers in some area will have the ability to give their animal to a Banjapur. But 99.9% .9 of people cannot do that. 99% of animals cannot go to a Pantrapur because there's no space. So here's what happens in Kutch. So you have these you know, illegal slaughterhouses. You have legal slaughterhouses. Sometimes they just let the animals die, get sick and die. That's what they do in the Goshala and Mulund. You know, I went there and they, I said, what do you do with all the babies? Every year you have 100 babies. They said, oh, most of them just die because they're living in such a filthy condition. They just get sick and they just die. And they're probably not fed properly. A lot of times in the village, they don't want to kill the animal. So they tie the animal up. They don't feed them any milk or water or anything. After two days, the animal dies. And they say, Bhagwan Legia. You know, they say, Bhagwan, you know, God took the animal, you know, because that's all they do. They don't want to send it for slaughter. But in many cases, like in Kutch, when I was in Kutch, they're, you know, they have these babies, males and females, that they don't need. They just sell them for 500 rupees and people slaughter them illegally because there's many people who do eat meat and they sell it or they consume it and they just say it's goat meat because there's a ban on you know cow slaughter but there's no ban on goat slaughter and nobody's going to check if the meat once they have some meat that it's a goat or not a goat or whatever it is you know so um that happens and a lot of times you know they just leave them out into the road they just let them go in the streets and you see all these animals in the streets because nobody wants that animal right and a lot of times they go into farm a farmer's field they start eating the crops in a farmer's field the farmer gives them poison and it dies because you know that they don't want to do that you know these are the street cows in india they're all over the place okay so basically if 300 million animals are born roughly 300 million animals have to die because the population can't go to 600 million and then into a billion you know you can't keep doubling the population so the population may increase a little bit but Generally, they're left to slaughter, you know, legal, illegal, starvation, you know, illness, abandonment. They're marched out of the state. You know, there's a state with a ban. They march into a different state, whatever. Okay. People think that you want to, we, we need all these animals for cow dung or, or urine. But, you know, if you have like, you know, 100,000 animals, that's plenty, not 300 million. And so 300 million are born, 300 million have got to die. And this is the problem with the milk industry. You have to keep making animals pregnant. You have an exponential growth in population and there's nothing else. There's no other option that one way or the other, they're going to die. Okay. And when we look at the environment, you know, I was telling you the statistics of Vaclav's meal where you have like, you know, so few wild animals and all of our, you know, we have 300 million uh, cattle in India. We have over a billion cattle in the world, 1.2 billion, but that outweighs all of the wild animals. We're pushing everything off the land and cutting down the forest to have these cattle. You know, we need to reduce the number drastically. And the only way to do that, you know, uh, is to, you know, and this, as, as I mentioned, we talked about the land, water, climate change, deforestation, you know. Um, you know, so the only way to really do that is we need to, um, we talked about this uh, cattle are invented by humans from the Iraq, you know. Um, you know, so basically we need to, we need to eat, you know, we need to, an alternative for these, you know, flesh for eggs and for milk. And instead of that, you know, we can have a healthy vegan diet. And the good news is that it's better for the environment. It's better for animals, but it's also better for our own health, which I'm going to talk about in my next presentation, you know, so I, I, I hope that you guys will have time to attend it. But we're going to talk about maximizing new human health, uh, with a vegan diet. You know, it doesn't mean that we can be bulletproof 
or you know it's it's not a bollywood movie where you're gonna you be a superhuman and you're not going to get any cancer or any disease ever of course we can still get that but we can definitely reduce the percentage of heart attacks reduce the percentage of diabetes probably protect our brain health we can uh also um we can also um um how do you call it uh um reduce some cancers like important cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer you know those are very important cancers colon cancer so there's a lot of benefits that we can reduce some of these diseases not eliminate but reduce and that's going to be fantastic for us you know, in india there's a lot of obesity right and uh you know so we want to reduce like heart attacks strokes diabetes cancer you know blood pressure cholesterol we can reduce the amount of medications you know and definitely you know like the the effect of milk you know, because a lot of people are vegetarian, but the effect of milk and animal protein, animal fat in milk is going to be the same effect of eating meat or eggs, roughly, roughly the same, you know, very similar in terms of um, uh, a lot of these chronic diseases that we want to avoid. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go too much further here, but um, let me see uh, if there's some questions. How many people are attending the uh, right now? How many people are here? Um, okay. Uh, there are several that? more on uh, watching on Facebook Live. Okay, great. That's great. I yeah. hope the voice has come clear. Uh, can anybody give me feedback on the quality of the audio that uh, when we're doing this? Is everybody satisfied with the quality of the audio? Maybe put in some comments, please. And on Facebook too, you know, let, let me know the quality of the audio. Um, um, the audio. Uh, yeah, it's perfect. It's good? Yeah? Okay, that's good. I'm always worried about, you know, um, the audio quality over the internet. Yeah, it's perfect. It's good? Really? Okay, Fantastic. Good. I'm always worried about, you know, um, audio quality over the okay that sounds good any more questions before we wrap up here okay good um so i want to say share i can share my slides with you i could share my um share my slides share my um uh, reference list so you can look at all the references and you know I want you to be able to verify any of the information that I'm giving you okay so that's very important to share my reference list and then you can share that with other people too now I have a whatsapp video called dairy production and cow slaughter in India has anybody seen this video can anybody tell me through the chat if there's uh, if anybody has seen this um, video I'm just looking at the questions is there a separate chat uh, thing here uh, compared to the um, chat oh, here oh good okay I, I see the chat I was looking at questions and I was looking at the chat now too um, ah oh, there's another question there too will sudden change in diet cause any problems will transition from non-vegan to vegan should I do it immediately or gradually okay good questions there too um, so listen if somebody wants to become vegan I think um, there's no right and wrong answer. You can do it quickly or you can do it slowly. There's no right and wrong answer. But what you must do is you must do it in a healthy fashion. That's the important thing. Whether you do it fast or whether you do it slow, for most people, they go slow because it's a little bit easier for them to learn new recipes and adjust one thing or two things at a time, get used to it, and then just adjust another thing. So for most people, some people do it fast too. So I'd say maybe, you know, 10, 20% people go fast and about, you know, maybe 75% people go slow. I went slow, you know, but so I want you to learn new recipes, learn how to eat more pulses, you know, and learn how to eat less fat and make sure you're eating whole grains and find out ways, you know, instead of on your chapati uh, putting butter, you can use maybe a little bit of flax oil or a little bit of olive oil or something like that on your roti. Find the things that you love. Flax oil tastes like, ghee actually it tastes very similar to ghee so flax oil is also an option you know um you know so find the different things that you enjoy try different soya milk in my presentation there's a 
uh, when you see the WhatsApp video, you will see there is, um, there's a guy named uh, Sunil Jain. He sells a soy milk machine, you know, that you can make your own soy milk at home. So that's good as well. Um, and so there's different, different things that you can do, you know, but make sure you get your B12. So start doing all of these things, learning all of these things. As well, in India, it's a little bit more difficult because in Canada, US, Europe, we have so many vegan products. We have so much different kinds of soy milk available. And frankly, the soy milk, the plain soy milk in North America tastes better than the one that you get in India. But that's going to change because there's going to be new soy milks coming in India. You know, a friend of mine, this guy that I, I met, you know, he's going to, you know, um, make a new soy milk. It's going to be better tasting and more widely available, you know. So the products are going to increase in quality and um, B12 is going to get cheaper. So these things are going to improve and we're going to introduce more and more product, products that can help people. So that's something to stay tuned, you know. And, um, and so whether you go slow, or whether you go fast, the more important thing is you do it healthy. You find good recipes that are tasty and healthy and nutritious and convenient and you share them with your friends and that you do it in a way that you don't go vegan and then you don't know what to eat and you do it for a while and then you're not eating the right foods and you don't feel good and you stop being vegan. That happens to a lot of people. Instead of that, it's important to bring in new, good, tasty, nutritious foods and increase your health every step of the way and see that you're getting more healthy and enjoying the food, um, you know, and that, uh, you know, and that you're, and then, you know, so whether you go gradual or not, it's just important that you do it in a healthy way. I hope that answers the question. And in this, uh, in this um, uh, Ahimsa festival, you're going to get a lot of good ideas on recipes and those kind of things too. Are there any ill effects of egg consumption? Yes. Egg has one of the most amounts of cholesterol and saturated fat. So definitely there's showing uh, higher amounts of heart disease with eggs compared to other foods. And also there is some evidence that it increases prostate cancer more than other foods uh, do. So that's, that's eggs. So definitely, you know, out of eggs, um, it has some of it a more concentrated uh, saturated fat cholesterol. Okay. Um, so listen, uh, how can I share my WhatsApp video? How can I share the WhatsApp video? Um, Rupa Ben, are people on yeah. the WhatsApp group here? Yeah, um, we have everyone's email here. Okay. And you have everybody's email? Okay. So yeah, maybe yeah. Also, I'll, sh I'll share some resources and links that... Um, you can uh, get the, the things that I'm, uh, you know, the, the different, um, um, the links I'm gonna send you. Also, uh, what I want is that maybe Rupa Ben, like I, the, the, the video is great on WhatsApp as well, because I have the video on YouTube, right? I have the uh, video on YouTube, but I want the video to be available um, through WhatsApp also. You know, uh, because that way people can share with each other. You know, give me a second. I'm, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to um, let me see. I'm going to let me exit the full screen of my thing here, my PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay, so let me go here. Uh, wow, this is a. The computer's not working exactly the same way. Well, here we go. Okay. Um, so let me share some things right away with everybody on the chat screen. Okay. 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 And this. Okay. And I'm going to share some things right now with everybody. Okay. Um, where's the, this, the one right here. This is a video. Now there's going to be updated version of this video coming pretty soon. Okay. And also this um, webinar is completely recorded and you know, we will put the edited version. Okay. For everyone Good. So, to all right. So this is okay. This is, um, YouTube video, okay, uh, which is about um, my nutrition video, okay, 
And then I'm going to go to this link over here. And, well, that's another, okay. Here, okay. Now my references are attached to the video, right? There we go. Uh, so that's the same video, different link. Okay, now let's go, okay, here. Um, some other really good, um, something on diabetes. Okay, that's very good here. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, this is articles about soy. Okay, oops. Copy, okay. And these are articles about soy and health. This is a great presentation about plant-based diet and the environment here, okay. Um, let's go to dairy production and cow slaughter in India. Okay, these are videos about Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. So there, there's some a lot of resources there. Okay, sorry to overload you with too many things. But the last thing, okay, um, is my um, uh, uh, videos about dairy production and cow slaughter in India, which you can watch on YouTube. But now I hope that people will also, and, and here's my reference lists, okay? All my references, I'm putting them there as well. I think I put too many things and hopefully it's not just too much stuff. So reference lists that you can download, um, uh, all of the health and uh, environmental references there, okay? So again, um, there's, you know, I, I wanna make an effort that when we talk about veganism, we do it in a very intelligent way, okay? That we uh, look at the science and have good references, you know? Um, now somebody has a question here about lupus. Uh, there is a very tiny amount of studies showing that uh, there may be some prevention of things like lupus uh, with plant-based diet, but I don't think we have strong signs to show that, okay? So there may be some possibility of it, but we don't have strong signs right now backing up the idea that we can reduce uh, inflammatory, like uh, these kind of um, um, autoimmune diseases. There's a little bit, there's a little bit. Um, here's a question from Suman. My old parents, uh, father aged 100, wow, that's beautiful, and mom 94, so I hope they're fantastically healthy. They're big fans of milky ghee, et cetera. They have been, uh, they have been and are non-vegetarians and have been generally good health. My father and mother have no sugar issue, and of course, they lead a simple lifestyle and keep up with walking twice a day. So that's fantastic that your, your um, parents are healthy. And definitely, I'm not saying that every single person who eats animal-based foods is gonna get cancer or gonna get heart disease, what happens is that there's, uh, there's, we increase the risk of these things uh, by one and we decrease the risk by another. You know, so maybe, you know, um, if we have people on a very, very nutritious plant-based diet and they're getting lots of good protein and, and they're getting lots of, the, you know, their, all their things, we might be able to increase the percentage. You know, right now, if in India, one out of, you know, uh, one out of uh, 100 people reach the age of 100 years old, maybe we would get it to 1.5 people out of 100 to age 100 years old. Your parents probably have a lot of good habits. You know, they're probably not overeating. They may not be eating huge amounts of these foods, but eating proportionally smaller amounts than a lot of people, let's say in Canada, US. Uh, they may be having some other good healthy foods too that are grains and fruits and vegetables and stuff, I hope, you know. Um, and like you said, they're keeping a simple lifestyle. That's very important. Simple lifestyle actually makes us more healthy as well. And they're walking twice a day. That's very, very important. Just because you're a vegan doesn't mean you stop your exercise. You still have to exercise. So your parents are doing a lot of healthy things. That's great. Um, 
you know, and, you know, for, for them, maybe genetically or whatever it is, they got the magic combination of genes that the milk and the, and the meat and those kind of things maybe are not causing so much of an impact. But on average, you know, some people are going to be fine like that. But if we want to increase the percentage of people who enjoy that lifestyle that your parents do, then a, a healthy plant-based diet could hopefully get a few more people to that point. Okay. So I hope that gives the things in perspective. It's not a black and white thing. It's really about helping people just push a little bit further, um, you know, and, and, and go a little bit further. It doesn't even, you know, plant-based diet doesn't always make you live longer because we have lots of medical interventions. We have, you know, stents and heart operations and cancer medications and everything like that that can cure a lot of these problems or make you live longer even if we don't cure it. But if you're vegan, maybe you get a lesser percentage of these problems. You can still get the same problem, but the percentage may be a bit less and maybe less severe so that you can enjoy a bit of a quality of life, even if through medications were, and, and medical interventions, we're able to make people live uh, an equal duration. You know, you may have less medications and health problems. So the quality of life may increase. Um, A1, A2 cow milk, you know, I don't think there's any evidence about uh, any difference there. Type 1 diabetes, somebody's asking, there is a small amount of evidence that there's less type 1 diabetes with people who are brought up on a plant-based diet, okay, because of uh, different antigen effects of animal foods, okay. But uh, so there's some small amount, but the majority of evidence is for type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, you know, um, is, 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 um, um, has the, the majority of the evidence. Type 1 diabetes, a small amount of evidence that maybe there could be some less cases of it, okay? But it's a small amount of evidence, not as solid, not so solid. We have to learn more. Type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes cannot be cured with a plant-based diet. You know, type 2 diabetes, if you have a, if you have a really healthy plant-based diet, people who uh, can reduce the severity of their type 2 diabetes, definitely. So if they have very severe, they can make it into a, a less severe, a milder form of diabetes. If they have a mild diabetes, maybe they can get rid of it altogether with a very good, that's a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Does, does not mean you're having farsan, does not mean you're eating jalebi, okay? You can't eat those things, all right? But um, type 1 diabetes, like a lot of type 1 diabetics, when they get older, they get a combination of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, okay? Because when they get older, uh, a lot of times they become obese, and they start developing insulin resistance, okay? So they start developing insulin resistance. They start requiring more and more insulin. At that point, a plant-based, whole food, low-fat, plant-based diet will help them keep their diabetes in control because now it's starting to get out of control because they're getting obese and getting insulin resistance. So that's the way it can help people with type 1 diabetes. There's no evidence that can reverse the... Um, reverse the damage to the pancreas caused by the autoimmune disease and type 1 diabetes otherwise, okay? There may be some preventive effect, you know, um, and I can maybe give you some references to type 1 diabetes. Um, there's like this minor amount of evidence. I can try to give that to you. There's a All question, right. one more question, last question. Okay. Is cholesterol uh, in egg white... Is it cholesterol in egg white? I think egg white does not have so much cholesterol. Most of the cholesterol is in the yolk, you know? So definitely um, if people eating just the egg white, there's going to be less uh, amount of cholesterol. But um, um, the, the animal protein itself has a different effect than plant protein. So we can, you know, so that may also have a little bit of an effect, you know, on, on some of the diseases as well. Okay. Okay. So, um, there's something else on the chat box. Uh, for systemic lupus and erythematosus, you know, I think you just have to have a healthy diet no matter what. You know, I don't know if there's good evidence um, regarding, uh, I'll, I'll throw some, give me some, give me one second here. You know, I don't think there's good evidence that we can really reverse, you know, um, some of these things like uh, systemic, um, um, like SLE, you know, but I would just say go on a very healthy diet, you know, whole food, low fat, plant-based diet, eat a lot of your fruits and vegetables, you know, fresh and have your whole grains, uh, have a little bit of healthy fats, but not too much. Definitely eat a lot of pulses, you know, and that's going to be healthy for you no matter what, you know, um, you know, but there's not necessarily um, uh, some special evidence that we're going to reduce um, 
are rheumatologic diseases. You know. Now here is some evidence about, here's some articles about rheumatologic diseases. I just have a couple of articles. I'm gonna share the, the link with you. Okay, so re regarding rheumatologic diseases. Okay, so that's for, um, uh, Okay, that's a link for some articles about autoimmune disease. As you can see, there's only a few like little things there, nothing huge. I don't think we're gonna cure anybody, but there's that. Now somebody was talking about, what else somebody was asking about um, that I wanted to give a link. Um, maybe that's enough links for now, okay. Well, listen, I, I encourage everybody to please join me for the health talk because obviously people have a lot of health questions something that concerns all of us and uh yeah, you know yeah. the and next webinar is on 8th of november it's the same time dairy industry and our health yeah so what i'm really going to do is i'm going to talk about health in general okay i'm going to talk about health in general check out my video okay you ask about what the healthy fats i mentioned them earlier in the present uh, in the in the uh thing about you know like a flax oil soybean oil it's not bad but olive oil and canola oil are the, being the best, you know, let's, uh, let's look at some of those things. Um, but actually just because we have some guests, I do have to go to go now. Um, yeah, sure. sorry about that, but, uh, yeah, you know, fine. definitely, you know, definitely we're going to have uh, another talk on health and the resources I have there. Take a look at them, including my presentation on health. It's uh, there's a good video of that. You'll enjoy that for sure. It's going to answer a lot of your questions. Okay. So thank you very much to everyone, okay? Uh, namaste. And I'm really glad that people are here from all different backgrounds in India. You know, I'm excited. India is a very multicultural place. So many different people with different backgrounds, different religions, different faiths, and everything like that. And it's really nice to see, just looking at the names here, I can see that there's people represented from, you know, uh, from everywhere. And, you know, that's the way we gotta be, you know? This should be very inclusive and um, help everybody. And we should do it in such a way that, um, you know, that people who have less money or who are more poor or whatever it is, also have access to really nutritious foods. And there's something, things like food security and food justice and things like that are also looked at. Okay, so uh, important topics for India. So thank you very much. And uh, let's, uh, you know, let's keep learning and uh, applying what we've learned as well. Just making a quick announcement that this is our brochure of Ahinsa Festival. It's about six page brochure with so many events. Today is day three. Uh, all the events are going very well. Uh, do take out time and attend them. They are all over Mumbai. Tell your friends. And there are six more webinars coming up in next 16 days. So what, what is the time and place? What is the time and date of my, uh, my next uh, webinar? Eighth of November, and okay. it's the same time, seven o'clock India time. So okay. whatever time we start. Perfect. So eighth of November. Okay. So everybody, tell your friends, tell your family about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You will really enjoy the health talk because obviously um, that's very concerning to, to everybody, really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Shall I end the okay. meeting now, everybody? Sure. Uh, anyone sure. wants to say something? Okay. As long as uh, people I, still I have keep, access. Keep it on to, for a minute. Yeah, keep it on, and so everybody can can download the references from the chat. Yeah, yeah? or uh, you want to yeah. share anything, or yeah, if anybody wants to share anything, you know, please do. Uh, I better go because otherwise I'm going to get in trouble on my end. Right? <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks everybody. I've, I've unmuted everyone, and if people want to share any feedback or write down, I'm here for another five minutes. Thanks, yeah. Usha. Okay, Lovely. you're very welcome. I'm going to stay on for a second. I want to hear what people are saying. Okay, you know, yeah. Before I sign out. I've unmuted. So if some of you are still here, you can talk. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> okay, no worries. All right, guys. I'm going to say goodbye okay. now. All right. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye. Talk bye. To you soon. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you.